everyone, this is Armin Ellis from Exploration Institute. We're really lucky to have with us Graham Hawkes, who is a legendary submersible designer. Graham, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, Graham, let's start with, um, with uh, your background. So you've been involved with submersibles for a very long time. Um, how did you get into this? Oh, well, I, I really wanted to build airplanes in London, England. <laughs> I messed up exams. I ended up as a civilian working with the Royal Navy on submarines and things like that. Mm -hmm. Things that go bump in the night. Okay. And that got you started in um, everything ocean related? Well, what it did was, it, you know, I, I really wanted to build airplanes, right? And I wished I'd been born 50 years earlier when you could build something in your backyard and go faster than everybody else. But that's 50 years too late. And then what I realized after looking at the submersibles and submarines for the military, mm -hmm. it, this was back where that was. And I could build something better than anybody else with nothing because the imagination which just wasn't there. So I ended up jumping out and kind of doing my own thing. Okay. Well, what did that look like? You went out and uh, started your own? What did it look like? Oh, well, in those days, it looked like a disaster initially, but I found, I was just lucky, I found two business partners who had a machine shop in Great Yarmouth, England, and they said, okay, come up, and they set me up. I worked in a derelict cottage, no electricity, I had a drawing board put over to a dirty window I had to clean, and I designed my first submersible there, and it actually turned out it was a great success. It was a thing called the Wasp. Mm -hmm. and, and there were, ended up like 25 of them built and in the North Sea. And they were the best thing out there. Wow. Are they still operating? Do you know? Do you know I think they are. Uh, I hear rumors they are. <laughs> and, uh, but looking back, they were, oh, so, um, so uncomfortable, crap things, but they were a big success at the time. Outstanding. So where did you go from there, from your early successes? Um, I went from there to build bigger, you know, manned vehicles. Um, and then I got really ambitious. I wanted to build one to go to the bottom of the planet. And the oil industry wasn't interested in that, the military weren't interested in that. And I came to the United States to kind of seek my fortune, but mainly to see if I could find funding. Um, never did until 40 years later. So if I could find funding to build this glass submarine that I was dreaming of. Mm. And um, how did you end up uh, going from uh, what was primarily very sort of utilitarian uh, sets of submarines to the kind of work that you do now? It's a very good question. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think at some point, well, I, I was successful out here. So we were building submersibles for offshore oil and gas, some for science, and then I just got frustrated. I just, I, I can tell you exactly what happened, if you really want to know. A friend of mine built his own sailboat, right? And I thought, holy cow, you know, this is a big thing, what a big project. He built it for himself. And I thought, I know, <laughs> I'll build a submarine for myself. And because it's for me, I don't have a customer. I don't have anybody with an opinion about what it should look like. I was free to kind of leap ahead to where I wanted to be. And I've been dreaming of flying underwater because the last sub I built was called Deep Roll. And let me tell you about Deep Roll. So I always test out my own machines, right? So we launched Deep Rover in Halifax in, in Canada. Nova Scotia. And I'm, I'm driving this submarine across the bottom of Halifax Harbor and it's got two monstrous great claws in the front because it's working for the oil industry, right? And I'm going across the bottom and in front of me I see a little crab. And it stops. And it rears up and it kind of clacks this thing because it's like it wants to fight. <laughs> and I, I burst out laughing because it's a tiny little thing. I'm in this huge monstrous machine with these big powerful arms and this little crab wants to fight or something. And, okay, you get a little crazy. So I was talking to the crab, I was saying, you know, you're a fool, you're just, you're stuck on the bottom, 
you're not even swimming around like everybody else. You're just stuck crawling on the bottom. Now, wait a minute, so am I. <laughs> and I remember thinking, you know, we both got this wrong, buddy. Um, I'm looking at these fish and thinking, we should be building beautiful machines that are flying through the water here. What am I doing sitting in this contraption sitting on the bottom? But nobody, there was no market. Nobody would want that. So I had to quit. And um, I don't know what I was thinking money-wise, but I just built it. That's Deep Flight. Outstanding. <laughs> wow. Uh, when was Deep Flight started? I started that project, I think, oh, in maybe 91, mm -hmm. 1991. Um, didn't get it launched until 1996. I had no idea how I lived for that time, but it was managed. And, um, and Deep Flight One made a transition from craft that were underwater balloons. All the submersibles were built for them. Mm -hmm. And my dear colleagues are still building, by the way. Um, just sink. You mm -hmm. get in them, you open valves, you flood up tanks, and they sink. Mm -hmm. right? And they go flat onto the bottom, and then you can move around. Whereas if you look at a dolphin or a shark, they're just moving through the water. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got the idea that if we built something that was very streamlined, it would be very beautiful and elegant, which I love. It would have wings. And when you do the math, you realize you're building an airplane. Remember, I wanted to build an airplane. And, you know, I tried to talk myself out of it, but, you know, water and air, providing you're not going supersonic in air, it's the same regime. So if form follows function, you end up building things for underwater flight that look not similar, but exactly like aircraft. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we're doing. And um, it was very successful. I, I, I launched Deep Flight One, just for me. And I was, we launched it off of um, the, the uh, aquarium in Monterey. And, oh boy, what an adventure. And so I was to see where my wife was. We helped fund this thing, you know, get the, we had, we had sponsors. I was jumping out of the water to see her and then diving back down, and jumping out of the water to see where I was going. And then I was supposed to be alongside this chase boat that had cameras, and I was worried the boat was gonna hit me, so I kept bobbing up and going down, looking at this boat. And when I came back out, people said, Wow, that was a fantastic show you put on. You look like a dolphin. You, you're having so much fun. I'm like, yeah, see, I probably did look like a dolphin. <laughs> yeah, I was having fun. And before that, I could promise you that everyone would come into my shop, look at this thing, and go, you won't get me in that. <laughs> you know, and they're very, very interested. After that, I'd see people looking at this and get this little wistful smile on their face, and they were saying, what was that like? <laughs> and they wanted to go. And so the next thing we built was a two-person trainer, and um, then uh, people once started wanting them, we started building them. <laughs> so um, you're really opening up exploration for a lot of people here by just giving them the right tool to conduct personal exploration. Yes. You know? Yeah. Oh, I think so. Absolutely, I think so. I mean. You know, so our point is that the next generation, I mean, the next 40 years, I'm going to repeat the last 40 years, and our generation, particularly our parents, had no access to the ocean. So right now, if you come to a conference like we are here, it's a big deal. I mean, we went through yesterday in a conference a list of all the submersibles operating on two hands. Mm -hmm. Look how big the planet is. It's an ocean planet. 95% of life is in the oceans, right? Earth is a really stupid name for this planet. We got 10 subs that crawl around on the bottom. That's it. <laughs> uh, it. It won't be it because we're building beautiful machines that are flying. And I tell you, I've got two teenagers that think it's the most natural thing in the world to go fly. And they're bugging me, Dad, when, you, when am I going to fly this thing? They don't want me flying it anymore. And, you know, to them, it can't be a big deal, can it? Because it's their dad. How big a deal can that be? Well, really, I mean, with the tools that you're making, give you a different way of exploring as well. It's not just going up and down where you 
you know what you're going to see at specific you know uh, depths, but it's a uh, you know it's into... worse than that, I'm afraid. Because um, we built a sub for Steve Fawcett that goes to 37,000 feet, so we have some idea about great depth. And I held the world record personally before that, by the way. It was rather silly, but I did. And um, so the, the, the old idea was that you're on this ship, and you launch a submarine, and you just drop straight underneath it. So all you're really aware of is the surface, and the, the bit on the bottom. And you drop right through this incredible blue space, which is the real habitat of Earth. Mm -hmm. That's where most of life is. Not on the surface, not with us grubbing around on terrestrial, not on the bottom in this mid-border common. I mean, it's just you drop through it like it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would just be bored while you drop through it. And so the machines we have they don't, they're not really exploring the bottom because mm -hmm. you're in mid-water and in mid-water, that's where the big animals are. So we're having these encounters with sharks. Not, not the way we have in the past, which is a diver cage, you track some food and these animals come around bored. Yeah. And you think you're going out because you're swimming with them, right? Mm -hmm. But a human scuba diver swimming relative to these animals is just a stationary object, trust me. Just a clumsy, stationary, goofy thing. And they're bored. Uh, but now we're moving with them and, and we're beginning to have these encounters and it's pretty magical, I can tell you. Pretty extraordinary. Not been done before. That's outstanding. Do you feel that um, uh, some of the uh, individuals who uh, dive with you uh, you really impact the way they look at the oceans just because of the way that they, um, you know, uh, they're exploring. Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I've seen it. I've, I've got some now friends that have done an awful lot in life. And one of them, I'm not going to mention his name, but I was staggered. He came out and said, Graham, that changed my life. <laughs> if you know who it is, you, you don't change that life that easy. It's not... And uh, so, you know, since then, um, you know, we've taken kids to Kings down. More than one king. More than one kid. Um, my mother-in-law, um, active duty test pilots. And I can tell you, everybody, everybody comes out um, grinning. Mm. But kind of peaceful. It's, there's some strange things that happen down there. Well, It's I not quite what you think. What are some of the best experiences that you've had, or some of the most memorable? Well, they go back, you know, I've been scared a few times. No, not in these new flying machines, but before that we built a deep rover, one of these normal old clunky machines. Mm -hmm. Test diving it off of Southern California. Supposedly on nice flat bottom terrain so we could a slope. But we know nothing about the ocean, so what we think on the charts is nice bottom terrain found myself on the top of a cliff mm -hmm. and having to kind of jump off of it to get to depth. And as I jumped, everything went wrong with the sub. A bit of a nightmare. Um, ended up falling down the slope, knocking a bunch of stuff loose, crashing to a stop at the bottom. All alarms were going off in the sub. Um, shutting things down, trying to get the sub under control and looking up and going, what the heck is that? This big black thing just kind of came slowly down and buried us. It was an avalanche. We got buried. Um, got out of that one. <laughs> uh, so that was interesting. <laughs> uh, but not, not the best thing. Some of the best times I've had actually, very recently, is just taking my kids down. Mm -hmm. Just seeing their reaction. It's just, you know, you can take an astronaut down. You take a king down, yeah, yeah, the two a penny. Um, but take your kids down, uh, 13, 14, 15, and see their reaction. Uh, it's just priceless. It's just priceless. Well, so if um, uh, there are people who want to follow any footsteps and uh, get involved in um, exploring the oceans, probably, you know, possibly maybe uh, from the engineering standpoint, what would you recommend for them? 
Uh, don't follow my footsteps because they're so convoluted I couldn't tell you what they are. Um, one thing is, well, just understand Earth is a silly name for an ocean planet. And here's the good news. It's actually great news for the next generation. This Earth is largely unexplored. I mean, don't think of it as a planet trodden over and explored by your parents and nothing left for you. Your parents are kind of clueless. Sorry, parents. Sorry, teachers. But, but they're the ones who caught this, this place Earth, and it's an ocean planet. Mm -hmm. And the ocean part's just unexplored. And um, I think the next generation are going to have the tools to do it. You're going to have to build them like I do. Um, just go use them, uh, I think. No, there, I believe, I believe this number's right, there's something like 17,000 mountains under the ocean. Mountains are qualified by height. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they haven't been climbed, they don't even have names. I mean, there's a whole planet to explore here. How great is that? It's pretty astonishing. Yeah. Well, so thank you so much. We really appreciate the conversation with you today. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you for watching the interview.